Shalom, shalom. We are back. And we are going to jump straight into Shofetim, Judges. And instead of starting from verse 4, I'd like to start from verse 1. It makes sense. So we're going to read Shofetim, Shofetim, Shofetim. <laughs> you are just talking about the tongue twisters after lunch. There we go. <laughs> Lead the way. <laughs> Shofetim, Judges, chapter 4 and chapter 5. Okay, so who's going who's gonna to read? Who, who's got their tongue straight? Okay. Okay, there we go. And when Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the eyes of Yahweh. Therefore Yahweh sold them into the hand of Yavin, the sovereign of Canaan, who reigned in Chatzor. And the commander of his army was Sisera, who was dwelling in Harosheth Hagoim. And the children of Israel cried out to Yahweh, because he had 900 chariots of iron, and for 20 years he harshly oppressed the children of Israel. And Devorah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was ruling Israel at that time. And she was dwelling under the palm tree of Devorah between Ramah and Beit El in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for right ruling. And she sent and called for Barak, son of Avinuam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, has not Yahweh Elohim of Israel commanded, Go, and you shall draw towards Mount Tavor, and shall take with you ten thousand men of the sons of Naphtali, and of the sons of Zebulun. And I shall draw, you, draw unto you Sisera, the commander of Yavin's army, with his chariots and his company at the Wadi Kishon, and shall give him into your hand. And Barak said to her, If you go with me, then I shall go. But if you do not go with me, I do not go. And she said, I shall certainly go with you. Only there shall be no esteem for you in the journey you are taking. For Yahweh is going to sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. So Devorah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. And he went up, ten thousand men under his command, and Devorah went up with him. And Geber the Canaanite of the children of Huavah, the father-in-law of Moshe, had separated himself from the Canaanites and pitched his tent near the terebin tree at Sa'anaim, which is beside Kadesh. And they reported to Sisera that Barak, son of Avinuam, had gone up to Mount Tavor. So Sisera called all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the people who were with him, from Harosheth Agoim to the Wadi Kishon. And Devura said to Barak, Rise up, for this is the day in which Yahweh has given Sisera into your hand. Has not Yahweh gone out before you? And Barak went down from Mount Tavor with 10,000 men after him. And Yahweh destroyed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera leaped from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Harosheth Goim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword, not one was left. Sisera, meanwhile, had fled on foot to the tent of Ya'al, the wife of Geber the Canaanite. For there was peace between Yavin, sovereign of Hatzor, and the house of Geber the Canaanite. And Yael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my master, turn aside to me, do not fear. So he turned aside with her into the tent, and she covered him with a blanket. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a bottle of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the door of the tent, and it shall be, if anyone comes and asks you and says, Is there a man here, you shall say no. But Ya'al, Geber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into the side of his head and it went down into the ground, for he was fast asleep and exhausted, and he died. And see, as Barak pursued Sisera, Ya'al came out to meet him and said to him, Come, let me show you the man whom you are seeking. And when he went into her tent, there lay Sisera, dead with the peg in the side of his head. And on that day Elohim humbled Yavin, sovereign of Canaan, in the presence of the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Yavin, sovereign of Canaan, until they had cut off Yavin, sovereign of Canaan. And on that day Devorah and Barak, son of Avinoam, sang, saying, For leaders leading in Israel, for the people volunteering, bless Yahweh. Hear, O sovereigns, give ear, O princes, I, I do sing to Yahweh. I sing praise to Yahweh Elohim of Israel. Yahweh, when you went out from Seir, when you stepped from the field of Edom, the earth shook and the heavens poured, 
The clouds also poured water. The mountains flowed at the presence of Yahweh. This Sinai at the presence of Yahweh Elohim of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Yael, the highways were deserted and the travellers went in crooked ways. Leadership ceased. It ceased in Israel. Until I, Devorah, arose, a mother in Israel arose. They chose new mighty ones. Then fighting was in the gates. Neither a shield nor spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is towards the inscribers of Israel, the volunteers among the people. Bless Yahweh. You who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, and you who walk along the way, declare it. By the voice of shouters, between the places of drawing water, there they recount the righteous acts of Yahweh, the righteous acts of his leadership in Israel. Then the people of Yahweh shall go down to the gates. Wake up, wake up, Devorah, wake up, wake up, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captives away, O son of Avinoam. Then he set the remnant to rule the nobles. Yahweh came down for me against the mighty ones. Out of Ephraim their root is against Amalek. After you, Benjamin, with your peoples, out of Machir inscribers came down, and out of Zebulun those who handle the scribes read. And the heads of Yusashar were with Devorah, and as Yusashar, so was Barak, sent into the valley under his command. Among the divisions of Reuben there were great searchings of heart. Why did you remain among the sheepfolds? To hear the bleatings of the flocks? The divisions of Reuben have great searchings of heart. Gilad remained beyond the Yarden. And why did Dan remain on ships? Asher continued at the seashore and remained by its landing places. Zebulun is a people who risked their lives to the point of death. Naphtali also on the heights of the field. Sovereigns came, they fought. Then the sovereigns of Canaan fought into Anach by the waters of Megiddo. They took no spoils of silver. From the heavens they fought, the stars from their courses fought against Sisera. The wadi of Kishon swept them away, that age-old wadi, the wadi of Kishon. O oh my being, you have trampled in strength. They stamped hoofs on horses, then stamped hoofs of horses with the galloping, galloping of his steed. Curse Meroz, said a messenger of Yahweh. Curse, curse its inhabitants, because they did not come to the help of Yahweh, to the help of Yahweh among the mighty. Blessed above women is Yael, the wife of Heber the Canaanite. Above women in tents, she is blessed. He asked for water, she gave milk. She brought out curdled milk in a bowl for nobles. She stretched her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's hammer. Then she pounded Sisera. She smashed his head. She pierced and struck through the side of his head. With, between her feet he bowed. Fell, he lay still. Between her feet he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell, destroyed. Through the window the mother of Sisera looked and cried out through the lattice, Why does his chariot delay to come? Why have the steps of his chariots, chariots tarried? The wise ones of his princesses answered her. Indeed, she answered herself. Do they not find and divide the spoil? A girl or two for each man? A spoil of dyed work for Sisera? A spoil of dyed work embroidered, dyed work richly embroidered for the necks of the looter. So do all your enemies perish, O Yahweh, but let those who love him be like the sun rising in its might, and the land had rest forty years. So no tongue twisting there. An enemish perish. An enemish perish. Okay, we've got the shh going on here. At least you can say shibboleth and not just sibboleth, hey? Okay. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to start at the beginning of Chapter 4. Um, well, it's always good to start at the beginning of somewhere. But it's just to set the scene because, yeah, the book of Judges carries valuable insight for us as it flows between the judges that rose up, helped Yahweh raise the deliverer, brought them back. Then they'd fall away to the ways of the nations, everyone doing what's right in their own eyes, etc., etc. And here when we see um, Ehud, you know, this was a saviour that Yahweh had raised up um, for Israel. He was a Binyamite who had a bit of an issue in his right hand. He was impeded in his right hand. And, and by the children of uh, Israel sent a present to Eglon, sovereign of Moab, and he went to see that 
big sovereign, you know, and he put that sovereign to death and brought victory. And, you know, after him we had Shamgar, and you can read in the previous chapter about Shamgar, Ehud, and Othniel, all three people that Yahweh used as deliverers for Israel. And after Ehud had brought this delivery of Israel from Eglon, they had peace for 80 years. Their land had rest for 80 years. I mean, that's a long period. I mean, you should have rest always. But in the phases of Israel's journey of obedience, disobedience, this was one of the longest, you know. And here it starts in this chapter, when Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the eyes of Yahweh, and therefore he sold them into the hands of Yavin, sovereign of Canaan. And he sent against them Sisera, who was the commander of the army. And they were crying out because Sisera had many chariots. It was a huge army that was coming. And so here they were crying out, and Yahweh, I mean, he still remains lovingly committed to his people. You know, and so Devorah, a prophetess of the day, her husband's name Lapidoth, and I think for good reason that he's mentioned there, so it's showing that she's still under the authority and covering of her husband. And at that stage, with her ruling Israel at that time, it just shows you the state of Israel where there wasn't proper rulership in place, there was no king. But at that time here, like in the days when Manuah, was visited by Yahweh. Here was a couple that was found to be righteous amidst a wicked time where everybody was doing what the nations were doing. So here Devorah is also found to be one as a prophetess calling people back, but nobody's listening. And here we see this Sisera coming against them and a huge threat, you know. And all these battles were the result of them not driving out all the Canaanites that they were sh that should have driven out. Yahweh said, if you don't drive them out, they're going to be thorns in your sides and pricks in your eyes. They're going to be a problem to you, you know, and you're going to be handed over to them because you're going to learn their ways, etc. And they just continue to not learn the lesson from. So you have a few years of rest. Oh, well, it's all right now. Now we can start doing and we can, you know, be buddy buddy with the nations again. And, and that's how compromise starts creeping in. You know, again, making friendship with the world, you make yourself an enemy of Elohim, and he uses the world to punish you. Think about that. That's the pattern we see. So, I mean, Sisera certainly was a, a commander of, of Yavin's army, were the enemies of Israel, but Yahweh used them to bring discipline and judgment upon Israel. But here Devorah rises up and she sends for Barak and says to him, listen, as a prophetess, she's declaring, go out and fight. Yahweh's going to give you victory. Barak, he's saying, well, if you don't go with me, I'm not going, you know. He, he, he's basically saying, yeah, if, if you don't go, I'm not going. And so it showed again, he was still looking at the flesh, not looking in belief. Here's the prophetess speaking a word of Yahweh to say, this is what you are to do, but still not putting trust in Yahweh. So by not, but he's, he also, in a sense, saw that if Devorah goes, then he has the assurance that Yahweh's with him. It shows you as the commander of Israel's army, Barak wasn't that confident in knowing Yahweh's with him. You know? And so he called Zebulun and Naphtali, and they went up, and Devorah went up with them. And as they were going, they told the, the Kenite, who was of the father-in-law of Moshe's descendants, told him, move away because we're going to... We're going to destroy these guys. And he listened. And so when Sisera called all his chariots, I mean, it's lots of chariots. It's, lots, it's a big army. And this is where trust and belief had to come in. And Devorah says to Barak, rise up. For well, this is the day in which Yahweh has given Sisera into your hand. Again, this is similar to what we read earlier in the, the Torah. Stand still and see today Yahweh fighting for you. Because the enemies that you see today, you're not going to see anymore kind of thing, you know. And so she's saying to stand, rise up because this is the day Yahweh's given them into your hand. Yahweh's giving you the victory. And remember who it is who gives you the victory. That's important, you know. Has not Yahweh gone out before you? In other words, he's, she's trying to, again, build up Barak's trust and belief in Yahweh, you know. And so they go out and they destroy this army, but Sisera gets away. He's fleeing because he's getting away. And he comes to this tent of Yael. What a wonderful woman. And in the song that Devorah sings, 
I mean, it's described as she took the hammer in her hand and the, or the, the peg in her hand and the hammer in her right hand and, oh, she smashed his head. I mean, it's very graphical, you know, and pierced his head right through to the ground. It was, it takes a lot of strength to do what she did. And so victory is sung. And, and when we look at this victory, victory sung about, victory is sung, victory is sung about, okay. And when you look at this victory that we see being given in chapter 4, we come to this chapter 5 where once again we see a wonderful song of deliverance. We looked at Moshe's song of deliverance in Shemot 15, and here we see this is one of the oldest poetic songs that's contained in the Tanakh, a song that greatly encourages us, and, and uh, we can also be challenged by as we look into the mirror of the word and reflect on our own lives. How are we looking? How are we praising? How are we walking in the victory and belief of our master, proclaiming our love for the deliverance of Yahweh? And can we be continually equipped to say, Yahweh, be exalted? Whether it's from the case of like Miriam again taking up the timbrels and saying the horse and the rider has been thrown into the sea, or whether it's uh, Devorah and Barak taking up the, the leadership in the song and declaring that Sisera and Yavin are dead, they, you know, Yahweh's brought victory, Yahweh's exalted. He's the one who brings the victory. And in Hebrew, what is Yahweh exalted expressed as? You should all know this by now after many Yigdal Yahweh, Amen. You know, when we think of this Yigdal Yahweh, Yigdal comes from the, the verb Gadal, which means to become great, to cause to be great, to magnify, promote. It's used about 115 or so times in the Tanakh, and it's often used as a word to express praise for Yahweh. And in Tehillah 40 verse 16, we see David declaring, let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your deliverance always say, Yigdal Yahweh. And this is something that we need to learn to be able to say as a confident praise of our master. Yahweh be exalted. I haven't done this myself. It's because of Yahweh. It's him who I praise. He fights for me. He's my strength. He's my deliverer. And when we consider this song that's been given here when it says, and on that day, this is the day that Devorah and Barak sang the song when we're looking at chapter 5. We see chapter 4 ends with the confirmation how the hand of Israel had grown stronger and the stronger that it had grown, it had grown strong against Yavin, sovereign of Canaan, until they cut him off. So they actually gained victory over the sovereign of Canaan. You know, and on that day, according to the reference of the victory over Canaan, Devorah and Barak sang this song. This was a spontaneous and an instantaneous song of praise at the victory over Yavin and the Canaanites. Proper praise, proper response to victory is one that's never delayed. You don't plan an event for victorious praise. When he brings the victory, you praise. In fact, we should be praising him as we go out to fight, but the victory that comes brings about something else. You know, and when we consider this, I ask you, how spontaneous and instantaneous is your song of praise in Yahweh in response to what he's done and continues to do in your life? Or are you one of those who, like the psalm says, how do you ask us for a song on foreign soil? by the rivers of Babel, there we sat and we wept. Or are you exalting in Yahweh? Because he is your deliverer, because he is the one to be exalted, and his name is being exalted upon your lips, making great his name. Have you found yourself in a place where you ought to have rendered unto Yahweh the praise that's due to him, yet found that you've actually responded with a delay? or you haven't responded because you've delayed that, uh, that ability. And as a result, you find that you lose fervency, you lose zeal that's needed to be a continued bold ambassador of the master. And by that, I mean, it's like, I don't even feel like trying to tell anybody about Yahweh. Some people get like that. What are, I don't want to go out and try and reach them now because they get deflated. But when you are celebrating everything that he's doing in your life always, you're always ready to give a reason for the hope that you have. Because why would you need to give a reason for the hope you have if anybody's 
only when it, somebody's asking you. And why would they be asking? Because they'd see, hey, why are you so chirpy today? Kind of thing, you know? When everybody else in the world is all doom and gloom and you're saying, praise Yahweh. We're different. And we should be. We need to be bold ambassadors of the good news, Yeshua Messiah, and not be afraid to do so. And when we look at the name Devorah, Devorah means a bee, and it comes from the verb davar, which is to speak word, command, desire, uh, declare, proclaim. And so we understand that she was used greatly by Yahweh to declare to Barak what he was to do and to bring about this victorious song of praise with Barak. And Barak means flash of lightning, coming from the verb to flash or to flash forth. And this primitive root, Verb is only used once in scripture in a psalm of David in Tehillah 114 verse 6, which was calling for Yahweh's deliverance. And he says, send forth lightning and scatter them, send forth your arrows and confuse them. So here we see a wonderful picture here again of Yahweh using the commander of the army as a representation of Yahweh's deliverance coming. And it comes with speed, like a lightning flash. Did I say something funny? Okay. No, you must share. I, okay. And so this song celebrates the deliverance of Elohim and with the name of Barak having the meaning of a flash of lightning and Devorah coming from the root, which means word. It's a shadow picture of the deliverance of Elohim who sends forth his lightning that scatters his enemies according to the clear prophecies of his word. So this song celebrates this power of Elohim and calls us to be bold in our declaration of making Yahweh great together. This was a clear call to praise Elohim. Devorah and Barak weren't going off, like Miriam, weren't going off on their own and singing a song. They were calling everyone to sing this song, you know. And this is a clear announcement that's being given to all of us today. We are to be singing the song of deliverance. Your life should represent a praise a song of deliverance unto Yahweh. Tehillah 34 verse 1 says, I bless Yahweh at all times. His praise is continually in my mouth. And so when we think about that, if you're not blessing Yahweh and his praise isn't in your mouth, you might just be in danger of cursing him and letting grumbling be on your mouth. Remember when you are striving with his word, with Moshe, you are trying Yahweh. So if you're not blessing Yahweh and praising him, you might just be striving with him and trying him. You know, and this is, this is quite a, a thing for us to, to take careful note of because here in verse 3, the clear call is, Hear, O sovereigns, give ear, O princes. I sing to Yahweh, I sing praises to Yahweh, Elohim of Israel. And then it, he, she gives a, a powerful kind of bit of history, you know, where Yahweh, you, when you went out from Seir when you stepped from the field of Edom. This is a clear picture of the magnificent presence of Yahweh coming forth for his beloved bride at Sinai, entering into a, a covenant with them. And just when he, she says the mountains flowed at the presence of Yahweh, this Sinai at the presence of Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, she's going back to marriage covenant. This is why he fights for his bride. This is who we are singing praise to. And she mentions um, Shamgar, which ends chapter 3. You know, in the days of Shamgar, the, the, the son of Anath, in the days of Yael, the highways were deserted, the travelers went in crooked ways. So in the days of Shamgar, in the days of Yael, Yael who put Sisera to death, which she sings about, which was in chapter 4, in those days, what was the state of Israel? There was no obedience. Highways were deserted. This is a picture. There will be a way. There will be a highway, the way of set-apartness. No fool is found upon it. So here she's saying, in their days, Shamgar and Yael, which is her days because it's happened now while she's still prophetess in Israel, everybody's been traveling their own way. They haven't been listening to Yahweh. There was no leadership. That's why Davora arose. So it's not like Yahweh used her because there was a lack of leadership. They chose new mighty ones. Then fighting was in the gates. In other words, they went away from you, Yahweh. They chose other ones to serve. There wasn't right ruling in the gates. There was fighting in the gates because this is what happens when you don't obey Yahweh's word. 
then people come and think they all know the word and they strive and fight with one another over interpretations and everybody wants to do their own way. And she says in verse 9, I love this, my heart is towards the inscribers of Israel, the volunteers among the people, bless Yahweh. In other words, here it is, this is a call. Our hearts must be toward the word of Yahweh, not toward the corruption of the nations. And here is calling for voluntary offering of praise. You know, our lives are to offer up the voluntary slaughter offerings of praise. And this is the call for the volunteers among the people to bless Yahweh. This is a call for you to remember the, 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 the slaughter offering, the voluntary offering in Hebrew is the nedevah. And it really is one that's done spontaneously. So here was a call for those who really serve Yahweh and love the word of Yahweh, bless Yahweh. And you who ride on white donkeys and sit on rich carpets and you who walk along the way, declare it. Because she's calling for everyone now to stop following their own ways, but bless Yahweh. Because Yahweh is sovereign supreme. And here's a call again. Wake up, wake up, Devorah, wake up. Sing a song. Arise, Barak. Again, this is a, she's basically saying she's, this is a, this is like a, cheerleading session in the sense of getting everyone to start to realize what they should now be doing, what they haven't been doing, and it's time to be making Yahweh great. Because what you have been doing is not making him great. You have not been exalting him. This is now time to exalt him. You know? And so out of Ephraim, their root is against Amalek. What's interesting here is a powerful picture of Yehoshua came from the tribe of Ephraim. And he's the one that led the victory against Amalek in the Valley of Rephidim. So we see this bringing back to covenant obedience that this song is continually speaking of. You know, Zevalin is a people who risk their lives to the point of death. Naphtali also on the heights of the field. Naphtali means wrestling. Zevalin means exalted. And I like the picture there because a people who shall be exalted by Yahweh because Yahweh lifts them up are those that are exalting the name of Yahweh because they are the ones that are willing to fight even to the death. Because they're not afraid of the one who can kill the body. And she just celebrates the victory of Yael and speaking how she's blessed above all women taking the strength that the fighting men should have been fighting the armies against Israel. And it took a woman to take a hammer and a nail and pound it through the head of the enemy. You know, and she goes into a few verses describing graphically what she did. And when we look at this celebration of praise, this is a powerful thing here and the declaration at the end that all the enemies of Yahweh perish. But let those who love him be like the sun rising in its might. And it's like, what was that proverb that says the light of the righteous or the, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that sh shines ever brighter to the perfect day. So in other words, this is a call again that you love Yahweh, be like the sun that's rising in its might. And after this victory, the land had rest another 40 years and, uh, you can continue reading chapter 6, say again, after the 40 years of rest, started doing evil in the eyes of Yahweh. It's just so sad to see how people in a time of rest can, in less than a generation, begin to do evil again. And yet we've got people today that are still holding on to the evil of many generations. And here is the call to wake up and start singing the correct song of exaltation to Yahweh and Yahweh alone, you know. When we think of this, these events here, this, is, this, this should strike us, especially with the Song of Moshe, and, and when we're looking at this here, uh, Song of Devorah and Barak, we have, a, we have an Elohim who longs to show himself strong on our behalf. But we should not fall prey to complacency because Maybe things seem to go well for a bit and it's almost like you drop your guard. No, our guarding of the word should be a continual service. And in that service, 
flows in the spontaneous praise of making great the name of Yahweh. You know, joining in that continual declaration of the set apartness and everlasting loving commitment of our Master. In verse 11, we're told that the declaration of the righteous acts of Yahweh, the people of Yahweh who would go down to the gates. This is again a people who are truly seeking Yahweh and his righteousness, because just as there's no more, got no more fighting in the gates. It's those who are going down to the gates for proper right ruling, for proper righteousness. This is when the good news is properly proclaimed and people will seek a proper right ruling from the word of Elohim. And they'll hunger and thirst for righteousness. The gates will be restored in administering the Torah as it should be administered and won't be con corrupting itself with the ways of the nations. In verses 12 to 18, as I said, this wake-up call that's given, we tie that in with the clear call in Yeshayahu 51 verse 9 where it says, Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of Yahweh. Awake as in the days of old, everlasting generations. Was it not you who cut Rahav in, uh, apart and pierced the crocodile? And in verse 17 of Yeshayahu 51, Awake, awake, arouse yourself. Rise up, O Yerushalayim, you who have cut... You who have drunk at the hand of Yahweh the cup of his wrath, you have drunk the dregs of the cup of reeling and drained it out. And then in chapter 52 of Yeshayahu, we again get awake, awake. Put on your strength, O Tzion. Put on your garments of splendor, O Yerushalayim, the set-apart city. For no more do the uncircumcised and the unclean come into you. This is what part of this victory song of Devorah and Barak is about. No longer is there corruption in the gates. And it lasted for 40 years. Should have lasted longer, but we get a picture here of those that actually were victorious in the battle, remained strengthened for a time to keep the proper right ruling of Yahweh intact. This was a call to wake up, and it's a call to arms. Getting excited, waking up from slumber, putting righteousness on, it's a time to act. It's a time to take action. That's what's being called for, and getting excited about it. This is, you know, when we look at these instructions to put on the master, it's supposed to be like, hey, I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stand on the battlefield. I'm ready to witness of my master. It's not a burdensome thing to, to oh, this is a call to wake up and sing. You know? How awesome is that? Wake up and sing a song. The word that's translated as sing in 5 verse 12, comes from the, the verb davar, which is actually to speak or word or counsel or warn or threaten. So in other words, we should learn to sing the word of Yahweh as well. This is part of, because our song to him should be in line with his word. And we know in, in the world that songs have a very powerful influence on directing people's thoughts, decisions, emotions, and so when we are singing the exaltation of Yahweh, our actions, our thoughts, and our ways will be directed for him. How important praise is in the life of the assembly, the body of Messiah. You know? Praise unto Yahweh is how we walk out our victory and become overcomers in him. Devorah was being summoned to sing this song, and it was to be done with great joy and diligence. Again, this was a picture of calling the nation to stand and see Yahweh bring deliverance. See him deliver enemies into your hand. In other words, don't be afraid to face what you need to face as long as you're in the master and bringing the proper praise that is due to them. Those in Zebulun and Naphtali that I, I've mentioned already, described as ones risking their lives to death, we see in Chazon 12, which we've mentioned a couple of times today with the Torah portion, in verse 10 to 11, he says, I heard a loud voice in the heaven saying, Now have come the deliverance and the power and the reign of our Elohim and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers who accused them before our Elohim day and night has been thrown down. And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their witness. And they did not love their lives to the death. In other words, they were willing to stand and fight the fight. They didn't give up. And by this we know Love, 
because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But whoever has his wor his, this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his tender affections from him, how does the love of Elohim stay in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Don't just speak blessings over somebody, but don't follow through with the blessing that you're trying to speak over them. If it's in the power of your hands to do something, it's part of exalting Yahweh together, you know. And so what we're taking note of here is that this chapter 5 from verse 19 to 23 gives us a, a recounting of the battle. And this commander of the army of Yavin, he thought he would easily walk over and wipe out Israel. He came with great arrogance. And that's what the enemy does. It arrogantly comes against the righteous. And when the sovereigns came out against Israel, Israel overcame them, beginning with a song and a proper response of praise to Yahweh, you know. This is, Yael means mountain goat. If any of you have ever thought, what does her name mean? Now, it's quite interesting when you think the significant significance here, because it's very prophetic in many ways, when it pictures the binding of Satan on Yom Kippur and the two goats that are taken, one for Azazel and one for Yisrael. And the one for Azazel being taken into the wilderness and one for Yisrael <clears throat> being offered up on the slaughter place, wherein we're able to see the prophetic sh uh, uh, shadowing of the redemption being made complete as Satan is destroyed. Because Sisera, as the commander of the army, is another picture of Satan trying to come against Yahweh's chosen bride. So Sisera was, by all accounts, while he was commander of an army, he was in many ways a mummy's boy, you know. And the recording here of his mother mourning for her son is another picture of the depravity of the enemy and her false system of worship being completely destroyed. When she was crying out, why is this chariot taking so long? She answered herself. She knew. And verse 31 makes it clear. The enemies of Yahweh will perish. That's as we end this chapter. The Yahweh, <laughs> sorry, my throat. <laughs> we have the assurance of seeing what we are told in Scripture coming to fruition if we just stay in the Master. You know, the path of the wicked is darkness. It just gets darker and darker and darker. But as I mentioned earlier, the path of the righteous is like that light of dawn that just keeps getting brighter. Keep shining your light. This is a powerful picture of understanding what we have in the Master. Can you hear this call today to wake up and sing? You know, Kepha reminds us that we are a chosen people, set apart unto our Master, a treasured possession that we are able to give our proper praise to him for calling us out of darkness into his marvelous light. The question that we must ask ourselves, even looking at this song and the song of Moshe and the, work, the, the readings that we've been doing today, in contrast to the grumbling and complaining that's been going on as well through the readings that we've looked at, what are we doing with our lips? Are we praising or are we moaning? Are we exulting or are we groaning? And so let this be an encouragement for us to recognize the praise that we should be giving to our master. You know, the Greek word for praise or praises is arete, which means moral excellence, virtue, purity, praise, etc. In other words, there needs to be a standard of excellence in how we are giving the praise to our exalted Elohim. We all love our master. We love his deliverance. I mean, is that true? Then what does the word say? All who love your deliverance shall say, one, two, three, Yigdal Yahweh. Hallelujah. Now you know how to say it, so there's no excuse. Now let your actions line up with that. Let Yahweh be exalted. Let Yahweh be made great. Tehillah 35 verse 27 to 28 says, Let those who delight in my righteous cause shout for joy and be glad, and let them always say, Let Yahweh be made great, who is desiring the peace of his servant. And my tongue shall speak of your righteousness, your praise, all day long. How's that going for you? Can you echo the psalmist? We'll hold each other accountable to be making Yahweh great together. Amen? Okay, so the, you've been stirred up now with 
ability to exalt Yahweh. So now we're going to look at some wonderful words of our master from Matit Yahu 5, the entire chapter. Who'd like to read this short chapter? The commander of an army and mommy's boy and away. Yes. <laughs> Okay, Jackie, you ready? Yes, sir. But when... <laughs> After all that. After all that. I started in Matthew 1. You'd have to read a while. Okay, there we go. But when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his taught ones came to him. And having opened his mouth, he was teaching them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, because theirs is the reign of the heavens. <clears throat> Blessed are those who mourn, because they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, because they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they shall be filled. Blessed are the compassionate, because they shall co obtain compassion. Blessed are the clean in heart, because they shall see Elohim. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they shall be called sons of Elohim. Blessed are those persecuted for righteousness' sake, because theirs is the reign of the heavens. Blessed are you when they reproach and persecute you, and falsely say every wicked word against you for my sake. Rejoice and be glad, because your reward is in the heaven, because your reward in the heavens is great. For in this way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt becomes tasteless, how shall it be seasoned? For it is no longer of any use but to be thrown out and to be trodden down by men. You are the light of the world. It is impossible for a city to be hidden on a mountain. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it shines to all those in the house. Let your light so shine before men, so that they see your good works and praise your Father who is in the heavens. Do not think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to complete. For truly, I say to you, Till the heaven and the earth pass away, one yod or one tittle shall by no means pass from the Torah till all be done. Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches men so, shall be called least in the reign of the heavens, but whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall by no means enter into the reign of the heavens. You heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that whoever is wroth with his brother without a cause shall be liable to judgment, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be liable to the Sanhedrin, but whoever says, You fool, shall be liable to the fire of Gehenna. If then you bring your gift to the slaughter place, and there remember, that your brother holds whatever against you, leave your gift there before the slaughter place and go. First make peace with your brother and then come and offer your gift. Be well minded with your opponent promptly while you are on the way with him, lest your opponent deliver you to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you shall by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. You heard that it was said in those days of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever, looking at a woman to lust for her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it away from you, for it is better for you that one of your members perish than for your entire body to be thrown into Gehenna. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away from you, for it is better for you that one of your members perish than for your entire body to be thrown into Gehenna. And it has been said, whoever puts away his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. 
But I say to you that whoever puts away his wife, except for the matter of whoring, makes her commit adultery. And whatever, and whoever marries a woman who has been put away commits adultery. Again, you heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to Yahweh. But I say to you, do not swear vainly at all, neither by the heaven, because it is Elohim's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great sovereign, nor swear by your head, because you are not able to make one hair white or black, but let your, your word yes be yes, and your no be no, and what goes beyond these is from the wicked one. You heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the wicked. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. And he who wishes to sue you and take away your inner garment, let him have your outer garment as well. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and from him who wishes to borrow from you, do not turn away. You heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those cursing you, do good to those hating you, and pray for those insulting you and persecuting you, so that you become sons of your Father in the heavens, because he makes his sun rise on the wicked and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those loving you, what reward have you? Are the tax collectors not doing the same too? And if you greet your brothers only, what do you do more than others? Are the tax collectors not doing so too? Therefore be perfect, as your Father in the heavens is perfect. Okay, so here we see a wonderful passage where our Master began to speak to the crowds, and for three chapters we see him giving what many have described as the Sermon on the Mount. Um, but when we look at this chapter, we see some wonderful insight into the blessing that we have in our Master. And we see this phrase, blessed are, or blessed is, and or blessed are you when. And so when we look at this, the, the Greek word that's used for blessed here is makarios, which is an adject, adjective that's used to describe a blessed one. And this word denotes the state of being marked by the fullness of Elohim, indicating the state of a true set-apart believer. So what we're giving here at the introduction of his message to the people is this is, this is what marks a true set-apart believer. And then after that, he goes on and describes the kind of actions that need to be done by the true blessed ones of the master, you know. And so to it, what it, it's actually a prolonged form of the poetical word makar, which means the same. And in, can, in essence, makarios can mean supremely blessed. So a better way of translating this would be supremely blessed are the poor in spirit or supremely blessed, because it's got to highlight how much of a blessing it is to be in this state as a taught one of the master. And to be makarios is understood in the Greek as equivalent to having the kingdom of Elohim in one's heart, highlighting the understanding that the word of Elohim is to be in our hearts and in our mouths to do it, as Devarim 30 tells us. You know, and so having identified what this word describes for us in being blessed, being marked as a true taught one of Elohim, this list here has also been described by many scholars over the years as the Beatitudes or the kind of attitude you ought to have, you know. And the first nine uses of makarios is mentioned in these verses from verse 3 to 11. So it's carrying a great platform that sets for the rest. Makarios is used 50 times in, in the renewed writings. But the first nine, the foundation of that is given here so that we understand what the blessing relates to down the line in the renewed writings. And so when we look at this, it, he starts off with saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. And the, the Greek word that's translated as poor is um, tochos, which means to crouch or cower or bend over. And it's related to the Hebrew word ani, which is to be afflicted or oppressed, coming from the word which means to bow down, you know, and be brought low. And so being poor in spirit 
actually denotes one who recognizes their spiritual helplessness in the sense of being the opposite of being proud and lofty. You know, being poor in spirit recognizes I need the master. It's not one, oh, I can do this myself and I'll puff my chest up and don't tell me what to do, you know. The one who's poor in spirit humbles themselves before the master, recognizing they need the master to tell them what to do. They don't just assume to do what they want and think that he'll just approve of it. A blessed is the poor one in the spirit because theirs is the reign of the heavens, because the one who humble themselves to the master and receive his instructions will be the ones that can carry out his instructions in rulership with him in the heavens. In the, when it's in, the, in um, the reign of the heavens, speaks about the reign that's coming here to the earth in the day of the master. And so we understand that this need for our ability to humble ourselves before the master, to, uh, Proverbs 29 verse 23 says, the pride of man brings him low, but the humble in spirit obtains esteem. So our master will lift up those that are bowed down. But the proud and lofty ones, he will destroy. So basically, we're saying here, those who truly humble themselves before the master and tremble at his word are supremely blessed. When you submit and subject yourself to listening to these instructions and following them, it's a blessing. Because that blessing will result in the reign of the heavens becoming that which you get to inherit. How awesome is that? Blessed are those who mourn. To mourn or lament, um, the Greek word that's used for mourn is pentheo, and then they will be comforted, is parakaleo, which means to invite or to call near, to be encouraged. And this is used in the sense of summonsing people together. So, you know, Yirmiyahu was one who mourned over the state of Israel because it was in a terrible state. And so when we look here, what's being taught here is the empowering comfort of our master is given to us to comfort one another. Shaul gives us this description in this letter to the Corinthians, how we, with the comfort that we receive from our master, we are able to comfort one another because he's given us his spirit, the comforter, to strengthen us. So when we're feeling down and low and dejected and we want to lament, we are encouraged by his word, not only to get up and actually begin to make his name great, but encourage others too, you know. And so when we understand this, mourners are comforted, um, the Greek word or the Hebrew word for mourning that we find in scripture, we see in Esther is Evel. And it says here in the days on which the Yehudim had rest from their enemies, the new moon which was turned from sorrow to joy from them and from mourning to a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy for sending portions to one, one another and gifts to the poor. Our master says he will take the oil of joy for mourning. I mean, we will see our mourning turned into rejoicing. This is a picture again of going from the day where we humble ourselves at Yom Kippur and we fast and we, we have that heart of repentance to the day that he fetches his bride. And that will be the day where our mourning will be turned into dancing. You know, because there will be a comfort of knowing that we can also come before our master and pour out our complaints before him. And we can know that we have one who comforts us and we have the blessing of him comforting us in our times of mourning. And Shaul talks about a body again where one part suffers, they all suffer. When one part rejoices, we all suffer. We all rejoice. <laughs> when one part rejoices, we all suffer. No, I think that's how some people feel sometimes. But the, the concept here again is that we are able to, when somebody's in mourning, maybe there's a loss, maybe there's some, we can go and we can comfort them. We can join them in their mourning and we can be comforters. We can be agents of comfort to one another, you know. Blessed are the meek for they'll inherit the earth. The meekness describes a a, a gentle and mild disposition. Um, the Hebrew word that's translated as meekness, anava, means humility and gentleness. Again, it it's carries the understanding of being grounded as well as one who can pay close attention and having one's ears open to proper instruction as opposed to one who's not gentle and mild, not meek, but is arrogant and proud and 
disobedient. The reward of humility is the fear of Yahweh riches and esteem and life. And Yaakov 4 reminds us to humble ourselves in the sight of the master and he will lift us up. This is a clear picture of our master saying the state of a true taught one is they're never thinking that they're above anyone else. They humble themselves. They walk in humility before the master. And meekness is not a weakness. It's a strength. It's a blessing. Because it's the meek that are going to inherit the earth. You know, those that think they're building empires today, those empires are going to come crumbling down very clearly. The opposite to meekness is pride. You know, pride will say, I'll do it my way. Even if it means staying away and sulking because things haven't gone my way. That's pride. Pride has a way of causing people to compromise their worship and not being accountable for it. Many people today, when they go through, through a great number of trials, and they might, sing, might say things like, I'll deal with it on my own, or that's how I'll deal with it. And they neglect to engage in living out the Torah and getting advice from brothers and sisters that are in the Torah, getting advice from those leading them. So they'll think, no, don't let me, I'll go to the world, I'll figure it out, don't tell me what to do. It's nice what you're saying, and I agree, it's nice what the word says, but, and you do the opposite. That's pride. Humility says, I'll submit to Yahweh's way, no matter the cost. And this results in trusting Yahweh. We spoke earlier about Yahweh taking Israel on a longer journey and changing their route to go around, so to learn how to trust him. Humility seeks to build and says, what can I bring? What can I give? What can I do? Whereas pride seeks to take and says, you know what, I'll give as little as, as I need to, and I'll take as much as I can. Pride carries an attitude of independence, not wanting to receive instruction, lone ranger, where humility reveals dependency and reliance upon Yahweh and the reliance upon being part of a body that works in unity of the spirit without causing division and tension and strife and, and, and that, you know, contention, not ten well, contention causes tension, yes. You know, so... Yahweh takes pleasure in his people. He embellishes the meek ones with deliverance. Now, isn't that, to think of the word embellish, I mean, he surrounds you. He covers you, you know. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Well, we could then say, we could turn these into say, cursed are those who are not hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Because those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. The Greek word that's, that's uh, translated as filled is chortazo. <laughs> okay, chortazo. It means to feed with herbs or grass or hay, to fill or to satisfy with food, to fully satisfy the, des the desire of any. And it comes from the root word chortos, which means a feeding place or a place where grass grows and animals graze. Some of you don't like that Greek word, but I think it's fine. And it's very fitting when our master tells us that he is a good shepherd, shepherd, makes us lie down in green pastures and we lack nothing because he feeds us. You know, there are other Greek words that we can translate as full of filled, and I find it interesting as we look at them that we are to be filled with something and we are not to be filled with other things. So it, what we are to be filled of and what we are not to be filled with or full of, you know. In other words, we mustn't be full of self. That's a good start. And I think they're having a good giggle there. I don't know what they're being filled with. So Acts 6 verse 8 says, Stephanus was filled with belief and power. Acts 7 verse 55, they were filled with the set-apart spirit. The taught ones in Acts 13 were filled with joy and the set-apart spirit. Philippians 1 verse 11 says, being filled with the fruit of righteousness. Colossians 1 verse 9 says, filled with the knowledge of his desire in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Colossians 3 says, filled with thanks. So we get an idea in scripture what we are to be filled with. When you're filled with thanks, when you're filled with wisdom and understanding, when you're filled with the spirit, when you're filled with knowledge of Elohim, there's no room for junk and rubbish to be coming out of our lives and out of our... There's no room for worry and fear and panic and stress and anxiety 
to be coming out of us. Yeshiyahu 66 says, Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you who love her. Rejoice greatly with her, all you who mourn for her, so that you feed and shall be satisfied with the breast of her comforts, so that you drink deeply and shall delight yourself in her overflowing esteem. For thus said Yahweh, See, I am extending peace to her like a river, and the esteem of the nations like a flowing stream, and you shall feed, and you shall be carried on the side and be fondled on her knees, and one who... One whom his, as one whom his mother comforts, so I comfort you. And in Jerusalem you are to be comforted. This is prophetic language of that which is still to come when our master takes us to Jerusalem and we build his reign with him here on earth and we become rulers with him during his day. And the comfort that we receive, that recovery of breath, we will see the nourishment. But now in him we are able to be comforted. We are able to be filled. We are able to have this hunger and thirst satisfied. In the days of Hanukkah, Hanukkah was told to go and proclaim a judgment against the Nephilim, the giants of old, and the, 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 the union that came about from those giants that were departed spirits, the demons, that their curse was that they would forever hunger and thirst and never be satisfied. Our master comes along and he gives the invitation, all who thirst come. He then says, unless you eat of me and drink of me, you have no part of me. We spoke earlier today about the manna that came out of heaven. He is that bread of life, something that we should not loathe and say, what is this? Oh, we don't have enough. We have been given more than what we need. We've been given all that we need for life and reverence. And therefore, we are supremely blessed because our hunger and thirst for righteousness has the assurance of being filled. But when you're hungering, thirsting for the riches of this world, you will never get filled because it will never be enough. Because the leech has two daughters, or how is it? Two daughters says, give, give, never enough, you know, because this is what the world does. It promotes schemes that once you do this, this is going to be your dream. And it always just rocking a carrot before your nose. And you can be like a dumb donkey chasing this carrot forever. You're just going to get tired. But when you're hungering and thirsting for guarding the word of Elohim, you will be fully nourished and supremely blessed. Amen. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the compassionate because they shall see Elohim or uh, no, because they shall obtain compassion. You know, we understand the power here of the compassion of our master that endures forever. And we have this wonderful promise of seeing that our master gives us all that we need for life and reverence. And when we have this promise of having compassion of our master, the wisdom from above is first clean, Yaakov says. Peaceable, gentle, ready to obey, filled with compassion and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. This is what we have in the Master. This is who we are, and this is what we can see when we see this. We have a compassionate Elohim, and, if, you know, and because of his compassion toward us, he has not destroyed us. And we can celebrate that. You know? Therefore, when we also seeing others, we can have that same compassion for others, not excusing away disobedience, calling people to repentance and having the compassion over them to teach them in the way and discipline them as needed, just as we too were disciplined in the master. Blessed are the clean in heart because they shall see Elohim. You know, our master can see our hearts and our hearts are to, are, are to be cleansed, our from, from a guilty conscience. Our hearts are to be washed in the Master's blood that rolls away the reproach of hypocrisy and all those wicked things that he says come out of the heart of man. But our fruit in our lives should reflect a clean heart because we'll know each other by our fruit as well. You know, just because our Master said you'll know them by their fruit and speaking of the religious Pharisees, he was giving a clear standard that this is how you'll know people, by the fruit of their lives. We can't see it. When we can never say, oh, but their heart is good. You can't. Oh, but I can see they've got a good heart. No, you can't. Only Yahweh can. And the quick, this is, a, this is what some people do when they want to excuse away or kind of cover over why people are not actually obeying the way they should. 
Yeah, but you know, Yahweh does see their heart. And yes, Yahweh does see their heart. You don't. And what you see out of their lives is disobedience. Therefore, you can't cover that over and excuse it away. You need to call it to account. That's the correct way of walking in love. Did you want to share something? You know? So when we see this clean in heart, there's a, there's a need for us to understand that when we turn to the master, the veil is taken away. Turning to the master implies a proper submission to his word, a proper obedience, seeing that his Torah is now written on, upon, on, upon our hearts so that we guard to do it. Therefore, we don't turn to the left or to the right. And we walk in his perfect ways and be perfect as he is perfect. Because when we do this, we have the assurance that we will see him face to face, which we now see dimly as in a mirror. But one day we will see him as he sees us. And how awesome will that be? Supremely blessed when you keep your hearts clean. When you keep your life clean before the master. Blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called sons of Elohim. You know, and so we see wonderful pictures here of our need to do our utmost to live at peace with one another. It's not always possible, but we're always, we're not out there to pick a fight. <laughs> you know, the fight sometimes comes to us, but as our master says here, when he slaps you on the one cheek, turn the other cheek. And don't do what Henry says, he's not turning a cheek, he's just running away. You know. <laughs> He was saying last week, but he, he, yeah, he didn't. Yeah, he, Henry said last week he hasn't got time to be turning another cheek because he's turned around and ran away already. You know, it's like, you know, jokes aside, I know I'm jumping ahead into this chapter, coming back in terms of peacemakers and what we are to be. We have peace with our master, and therefore we can walk in that shalom. And we are to bring that shalom, that completeness of the master. Everywhere we find ourselves, doing our utmost to do so. And you know what? Responding to violence with violence never solves anything. It's not the way of our master. Even when Kepha cut the soldier's ear off, he said, put that away. Those who live by the sword are going to die by the sword. So if you want to go out and pick fights, that's how you're going to die. But it's not the way of the master. You need to do your utmost to be a peacemaker, even when you're wronged. So somebody slaps you on the cheek, it's not a retaliation. I can now slap you back. It's, a, it's a, now a time for you to say, hey, let's talk about this. Because responding in the flesh with anger and fighting techniques is not the way to go, you know. And so we are blessed when we do our utmost to live in the shalom of our master and have that be the forefront of our thinking of doing our utmost to have, whether it's shalom in Hebrew or Irene in Greek, it's because we have peace with Elohim that we can do our best to live at peace with others. If people don't want to accept us, we walk away, we dust our feet, but we don't pick fights. You know? Blessed are they when they reproach you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of things against you, wicked words against you for his sake. When people are accusing you for things for your own sake, that's because you're doing stupid things. Kepha reminds us it's not a blessing to get a beating for when you're stupid. Wow. Doing wrong. Well, you're stupid when you're doing wrong. <laughs> you know, but when people are reproaching you and persecuting you and saying wicked things against you because you're obedient to the word. See the blessing in that because they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And we have in no way resisted even until death or blood like the prophets did. You know, Yeshiyahu was sawn in half by the wicked king Manasseh. You know, Yirmiyahu was thrown into dry wells. You know, some of them were chained and beaten. And, you know, so when we look at these things, all for the sake of the kingdom of our master. So therefore, when people want to say ugly things about you, don't retaliate. It's actually part of understanding, hey, just like they did the prophets, I'm not, it's not going to break me down. I'm going to see the supreme blessing there is in that, in continuing to stand steadfast in the master. Does it make sense? 
Rejoice and be glad because your reward in the heavens is great. You know, a lot of people, when people are persecuted or reproached or people say wicked things against them, they think they're going to get, they're going to give this guy his reward now. And they think they're going to get themselves a reward for feeling good for taking vengeance. Leave vengeance to Yahweh. Your reward is in the heavens. And all of these build upon each other, walking in humility, walking in submission to the master, hungering for righteousness, having the compassion that we need to have of our master, being clean in heart, doing our utmost to live at peace with one another. Then when people come against us with wicked words, it doesn't matter, you know. And then he explains why you are blessed, because you're the salt of the earth. Now, the Greek word for salt has the idea of rubbing together and pulverizing. And it's always with the idea of facing the pressures and trials of life. And when we look at salt representing covenant, the perpetuity of covenant, and with every offering you were to bring salt, we understand that when we are the salt of the earth, we are to be representation of the covenant marriage with our maker wherever we are. And it will come with thlipsis, <laughs> the Greek word for pressures. You know, and you are the light of this world. But if you become useless in being the salt, in other words, you're not representing covenant relationship, you will be thrown out and trodden underfoot. Tr trod underfoot. Trodden underfoot. You are the light of the world. You don't hide that light, you let your light shine. There's a purpose for a light. A, a light is to shine in the darkness. You know? They don't light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand. So let your good works be seen so that they praise our master in the day of his visitation because every tongue, they might not be praising him now when they see your good works, but that doesn't mean because they're not acknowledging what you're doing as good because they're persecuting you for righteousness sake. Don't stop shining. That's what our master is saying here. Keep being covenant represent representatives. Keep shining the light of that covenant and let them see your good works. Don't think I came to destroy the Torah and the prophets. Do you see how it flows? This is what you are blessed when you walk humbly with Yahweh. This is what you are representing, the covenant. This is how you do it. You shine it. You make it known. And don't think I came to destroy the Torah and the prophets because it's the Torah and the prophets that help you shine the light and continually stand in covenant. It helps you be supremely blessed. Not one yot or tittle is going to pass away until the heavens and earth pass away. And by the way, the heavens and earth are still here. So therefore, the Torah is valid. And then he gives this parable, because remember, he's speaking in parables. Whoever's least in the kingdom and teaches men uh, uh, you, you know, to do least will be least in the reign and who do most. And then he carries on. So people think, okay, well, I'll just do the least, you know, and the minimum requirements. What's, what's the least I have to do? And think, I'll still get into the reign, but they don't read further on. He says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will by no means enter into the reign of the heavens. Why? Because the Pharisees taught Moshe, but they didn't do Moshe, you know. And they taught Moshe and added to that, so they took away some yachts and tittles, if I want to look at, so they brought across their own commands and instructions to overpower people, claiming an authority in the seat of Moshe, but not doing what Moshe says, and he says, when you are a religious hypocrite like that, you're not going to enter into the reign of the heavens. No matter how much you think, but didn't we? And then men, think about when our master says, many will come and say, but didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do that? Away from me, I don't know you, you who work lawlessness. You know? Oh, by the way. Yes. The God's going to talk about the vowel pointing that was added so people could understand yes. how to read the Hebrew. Yes. Now people today say, you can't use those. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the yachts and the titles help us phonetically get the the Hebrew right in speaking so we can communicate correctly. And it shows the various tenses in a word so that you can know what action's being done to who, by who, from who. You get the meaning? So when some people claim I had a guy the other day comment on me, oh, am I of this sort, you know, and uh, 
you know, because of the way my, my presentation of the correct pronunciation of Yahweh, you know, grammatically speaking, and then I was told, oh, you're one of those Jacenius sort, you know, and you get, you, you, I never, I've never seen in any uh, um, transcripts all the, the vowel pointings. And I thought, okay, well, how are you ever going to read Hebrew then? So we've, we've got this move today that are claiming, look, Paleo-Hebrew is still Hebrew. Let's just not, it's not a different language. But if anybody would like, I can email you a PDF of the Paleo-Hebrew, see if you can read it. I mean, most people can't even read the Hebrew and get the vowel pointings right. You definitely can't read the squiggles of Paleo. So there's this move today that are trying to say, because of what the Masoretes put as vowel pointings, which I know was a couple of centuries after Messiah, but already by the time of Messiah, he was saying the markers that are given to help you read and understand the tension of the word, that's not going to be taken away. Not even those. Not even those. those. They, they just give you insight of how to read the, the consonants together in a correct pattern and tense of the structure of a verse or passage. And so... We understand then that our master is saying he came to fully proclaim that which is in the Torah and the prophets. He came to meet its requirements, which he did, but that doesn't mean, okay, it's done now, it's done away with. What he's saying is the requirements required by the blood he met. He met. And so we understand this in terms of the change of the order of the priesthood. And the change that he brought was how to draw near, no longer by blood of bulls and goats, which was a pattern that Moshe was given of that which is above, which is only by the blood of Messiah, because no blood of bulls and goats could be taken into the heavens. But he took his own blood into the heavens, because that was the shadow picture. So in terms of obedience to the Torah, that's never changed. And anybody who tries to add or take away from it can't think, oh, I'll be least or greatest, because even the taught ones of the master wanted to be the greatest, the right hand and left hand. He said, you don't know what you're asking, you know? And so our master makes it clear, and then he begins his teachings in the rest from ch this chapter and chapter 6 and 7, and it starts to bring into clarity how he is teaching the Torah and the prophets of calling people back to obedience, for they had many of them had fallen prey to the hypocrisy of the leaven of the Pharisees. And here is the pure bread from heaven sitting down, speaking to them, and declaring them exactly what the Torah is. He was bringing the clear standard of the Torah in a practical means. And he starts off and he says, you, you know, about murder and adultery. And um, he gets to the heart of the issue because he's now bringing out, even if you've stirred something, even if you've already thought about these things, You've already committed it in your being already. It's already there, and that's what needs to get cleansed inside you. Your hearts need to be cleansed, you know. And I love this here, and he's also saying, you know, if you bring your gift to the slaughter place and remember your brother has whatever against you, leave it there. Go and try and make right. Go and make right with him and come back. Now, it's not always possible to make right with somebody who has somebody against you, but you do your utmost to be a peacemaker. He's already said, blessed are the peacemakers. Okay? But he also, he's saying here, be, be well, I love this passage, be well-minded with your opponent promptly while you're on the way with him, lest he delivers you over to the judge and you're thrown into prison. He won't get out until you've paid. Here's a submission to authority. Don't try and say, I don't have a responsibility now because, you know, well, stuff you. I took from you, but I'm not going to give it back to you. That's not the right way. You'll get thrown into prison and you can't moan about it. But if you can, do your utmost. Go and make right with him while he's on the way so you don't. And I mean, what he's warning against here, don't just sit back and wait for a system to judge you. Try and make right the way you can. That's the heart behind it, you know. If your right eye causes you to sin, if your Hand causes you to sin. Pluck it out. Cut, cut it off. Now, that's not practically, I, you know, these are parables. Our master wasn't being, what do you call it? How can I say when people are hurting their own bodies? Sadistic. 
He wasn't saying pull out your eye and you, you know, had people off there. What he's saying is what you're looking at, if it's causing you to sin, if it's causing you to look at something you shouldn't, a woman lustfully or anything else, and everything around that, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, pluck your eye out. In other words, turn away from that. Don't let that be something that is in your life to be looked at anymore. And if your right hand is causing you to sin, if that which you are doing is causing lawlessness in you, cut those things off in your life. Do them no more. Go and sin no more. And then he's basically saying what they had as a tradition here was just to put their wives out. They weren't following the correct procedure in Torah by issuing a certificate of divorce, sending them out with the correct provision and writing down exactly why they were, and for the matter of adultery, when there has been a break in the marriage bond. Id idolatry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So idolatry, because when one is caught in adultery, they were stoned, with the two of them brought together. What it's talking about here, at the time when our master was in the flesh, it became convenient for people just to say three times, I divorce you, and that's it. Now no more responsibility. And then when that one that you've divorced or you've sent away, not divorced, you've sent away because the divorce procedure is not full yet, that one is still legally married and joining themselves to another causes that one to commit adultery. And that's what he was saying, you know. Let your yes be yes, no be no. Anything beyond that is from the wicked one. In other words, when you're making a commitment, you make sure that you fulfill it. The Torah says that when you do not keep a vow or an oath, it will be sin in you until it's accomplished. So we must be on guard against keeping our word. That's what it comes. That's the heart of these commands. Let, let your word be taken seriously. When you say yes to something, it can be seen as already done. It's, but don't just say yes and you actually mean no. Or say no when you actually are able to say yes. Be decisive. You know? And if somebody wants to sue you, let them take all. You know what? Be wronged if that's what it takes. And he goes on to the heart. Love your enemies. Bless those cursing you. The heart behind the thing here is not always trying to get your own way. Yahweh is your provider. And as long as you're doing what's right in his eyes, you can put your trust in him. You don't have to fight to get your way. You don't have to fight to get what you think you deserve and you know you have a right to. In actual fact, being bought at a price, you have no rights except to walk in the master's commands and receive his provision for your life. We are sons and daughters of our Father in the heavens. And here's a wonderful thing that people often neglect to see, that he causes the sun to rise on the wicked and on the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. So, you know what? We shouldn't be like, is it Psalm 37, which says, oh, I saw the, the wicked and doing, I, don't know, I, was, I was a bit grieved in my heart because I saw how they were just getting their way, you know, and he's kind of reflecting this heart behind, it doesn't seem right that they always get what they want, they're prospering, they're not listening to you. And then he said, but then... When I saw their end, when I went into your hechel and I saw their end, I saw what's coming. You know what? Let the people get what they want. Because as we see right now, you know what? The, the wicked are blessing themselves, but their reward is already here. And everything is from Yahweh. But what we have been called to do is to walk in our master's clear commands, singing with pleasure in our hearts the esteem of our Elohim, guarding to do everything. And this chapter ends with a clear call to be perfect as Elohim is perfect, as our Father in the heavens is perfect. And then it carries on in chapter 6, beware of doing your kind deeds before men in order to be seen. I'm just carrying on because you can, I encourage you to go and read chapter 6 and 7 collectively with this, maybe a bit later or during the week. But it just gives you some wonderful insight as you see the flow of our Master's words because it all comes down to Heart action. Does that make sense? Because our, what we do will reveal what's truly in our hearts. 
And if we're resistant to authorities, if we're pride, proud, if we're proud in our stand of not wanting to actually listen to instruction, take advice, get wisdom and understanding, then all it's revealing is a wicked heart that is in severe danger of being thrown out and trampled underfoot. Because the heart of the wicked will be destroyed. But we've been given a clear promise of the supreme blessing of those who have cleansed their hearts and walking in the true humility and fear of the master. Any thoughts on this passage? I mean, there's a lot more that one can go through in digging into the various Greek words. I did send a message out on the Beatitudes, looking at that. So spend time looking at that and gain some more insights. But one of the things that we take note of here in our master's words is that we have a responsibility to be found as worthy ambassadors of his reign and today realize the supreme blessing of no longer being of this world, but being in the master. He's called us out of darkness. And let your, let your light shine. Let your praise be heard. Ultimately, let your praise be heard by our master. <laughs> you know, that's the main thing. But what I'm saying is our lives should, I don't know how to say it, it should be that fragrance of Messiah. I was going to say ooze out, but it sounds weird. But it should, it should glow. It should glow and flow. How's that? You know? Glow and flow with praise for our master as we make his name great together. That's the way we can end today's readings, I think. Any thoughts? Any comments? Anybody online would like to share anything? We'll give you a moment or two. The master said that he would have pressure in this world, but he has spoken his words to us so that we can have peace. So what we're hearing today here is that we can have peace. We will have pressure, but take courage because he's overcome the world. That's what he's saying. I've spoken this to you, not to say that you'll now be excused from pressures, but that you'll actually have shalom in facing those pressures and have the courage to stand firm in the truth. Because in him... You can overcome. No, that's, a, that's the formula. Am I? Nobody online want to share anything? I just want to see how it looks like a WhatsApp thing here. Okay. Uh, Joshua is saying, he first said earlier, just when we started afternoon session, I'm revived by the following words. When you truly praise Yahweh, even in the darkest moment, there's a weight that gets lifted up. Does the circumstances change? No, but the outlook towards them changes. Then may we not reject the light, but continue walking even as he walked and believe that Yahweh's presence is always with us like it was with Israel when they obeyed his commands. Important point that you, you're putting there, that he was always with Israel when they obeyed his commands. When they didn't obey, his esteem left, you know. So let's be a people that are shining, that keep shining the light and knowing Yahweh is with us. I hope that we're all encouraged to just keep making Yahweh's name great. This is what it's all about. But you can't make it great if you don't know who he is. And you will never know who he is if you don't study and meditate on his word, if you don't give ear to his word and apply his word. You know, So our knowledge in him grows as we do his word and go out and get our daily manna and enjoy bearing the fruit of righteousness to the praise and esteem of his name alone, the only name that is to be exalted. You don't need to make your name great. <laughs> you know, the world teaches you that, but you don't. You need to make Yahweh's name great. My favorite chronicles is the eyes of Yahweh are searching throughout the earth. Looking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are perfect toward him. Yes. He's just waiting. Yeah. He's desiring just to see. Through his love. 
give them an opportunity. <laughs> You, you said earlier today about the wilderness journey and learning to trust Yahweh. Um, well, Tehillah 119 verse 165 says, Great peace have those loving your Torah, and for them there's no stumbling block. I mean, that's, that's a wonderful verse just to exp give it quite plainly. But then in Yeshayahu 26 verse 3 it says, The one steadfast of mind you guard in perfect peace, for he trusts in you. How awesome is that? Now in Hebrew that's Yetzer, Samuch, Titzor, Shalom, Shalom, Ki, Becha, Batuach. The Shalom, Shalom is the perfect peace. And this could literally be translated as he whose mind is steadfast, you keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Because the one who's steadfast in mind is not wavering in opinion, he's steadfast in the one whom he trusts and who his trust is. Yirmiyahu says, blessed is the man who trusts Yahweh and makes Yahweh his trust because he will be like a tree planted by the waters who does not see when the heat comes and whose leaf does not wither, but it grows its fruit in its season. And this is the joy. But woe to those who are not in the master because they're going to wither away, you know. And so we have this powerful picture of understanding the shalom that we have in our master. And that shalom should overflow into abundant praise. So when we think of the readings that we've looked at today coming out from Sukkot to the crossing of the, the Sea of Reeds and then coming to Piachiroth where they crossed and then coming to Mara and the rock being struck and then we ended with Rephidim which is just at the base of Mount Sinai. So they're just about to get to where Yahweh said you will worship me on this mountain. We're going to continue looking at their journey from there onwards and then we looked at Devorah and Barak and the victory over Yavin and Sisera, the commander of his army, and destroying the Canaanites and having peace, shalom for 40 years and the song of deliverance that was sung, looking at the heroic actions of Yael, taking a stand of righteousness and the description of Zebulun and Naphtali being those who will even, you know, willing to fight to the death. And then we see the blessing of staying in our master, being supremely blessed by guarding the commands, being peacemakers, walking in humility. The wonderful lessons that we can all tie in together today that enhances our realization of being able to truly declare Yigdal Yahweh. Amen. Let's pray. Master Yahweh, we bless you and we praise you and we thank you that we can say with confidence in our heart, Yigdal Yahweh, may you be made great. And when you are being made great, it's not about us, it's about you. And we thank you that you have given us all that we need to serve you. You have given us completeness, wholeness. You have given us sound teaching, sound words to encourage us, to take courage and overcome even in the most toughest of pressures that we might find ourselves in. Never taking our feet off of the rock that you firmly planted our feet upon. Master Yahweh, we bless and praise your wondrous and mighty name, and I pray that our lives would be able to echo the kind of deliverance songs that we see being witnessed, whether it's from Shemot or Devorah or what we read in Chazon, those who have overcome are able to sing the song of Moshe and the song of the Lamb. We want to keep singing those, those songs of deliverance in our lives right now. I ask and pray that you guard our hearts and minds perfectly in you and create in us a pure heart, a clean heart, a steadfast spirit. Renew us to complete service unto you and you alone so that we make your name great. And when your name is made great, there's no room for anything else but you. We ask that you continue to sustain us as we go through this week. We will diligently get our mana every day, delighting ourselves in you and with great hope and excitement coming back into your presence to be gathered and celebrate your Shabbat once again as we look forward to the soon return of our husband and king to take us to be with you forever. In the name of Yehoshua, our Messiah. Amen and Amen.